This is a recording of a lecture that I gave at the RCOG World Congress in March 2014 in Hyderabad, India. The title is The Cost of Institutional Births, a Wake-Up Call for Obstetricians. I have to thank the RCOG Conference Committee for inviting me to speak on this subject and also for giving me the title of this talk which I did not choose for myself. It shows that the Conference Committee wanted a reflection on obstetric practice, but also to bridge a traditional gap in undergraduate and postgraduate medical education. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born in Sri Lanka, but I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist working in London. I'm an honorary senior lecturer at University College London, where I work as a medical educator. My clinical research was in mysoprostol. I have a master's in epidemiology and I have been working in the arena of human rights in childbirth and I've authored a book called The Heart in the Womb. So briefly, the learning objectives for this lecture are that I'm going to discuss the birthplace research findings with relation to maternal outcomes I'm going to discuss the benefits of physiological birth and also the concept of birth ecology. I'm going to look at continuity of care and support and how it improves maternal outcomes and also the fact that maternity care can become inhumane when institutions develop a factory line mentality. So why institutionalised birth? Well, in the UK, after the Second World War, when the NHS was founded, it was thought that rich women delivered in hospitals with obstetric care, so this must be the best care. And so birth transferred in from home to hospital. When looking at a developing country model, um, the three delays has informed the uh, public health decision to recommend institutional deliveries for all women and this is part of the Millennium Development Goal 5. The three delays um, can be seen as one, a delay in identifying a pregnancy complication if a, if a woman is um, birthing in a remote location and then there can be a delay in deciding to seek appropriate medical care in an emergency. The second delay may relate to a low woman's social status she may not be able to make the decision herself to transfer into a facility. She may have to seek the permission of her husband or a village elder. She may also experience difficulties in transport. She may only have a bicycle or a donkey to transfer her in, and there may be very vast um, uh, distances to travel to reach the obstetric unit. The third delay can actually even occur at a obstetric facility where they can uh, perhaps not be the right skill mix or have problems with blood transfusion services. It is easy to think that if you transfer all births into hospital that care is optimised, but uh, it can be uh, good to reflect on the birthplace findings, um, the birthplace research findings from um, very recent study. Uh, a lot of birthplace studies have occurred in developed country settings where it is possible to compare home versus birth centre versus obstetric unit hospital birth. In these studies uh, they have found that low-risk women have a lower chance of having a physiological birth in hospital institutions. This means that low-risk women have a higher chance of a caesarean birth or some form of operative delivery. In uh, Dutch data it shows that women who receive hospital care that are low risk have a higher chance of severe adverse maternal outcomes such as admission to intensive care units. And population studies have shown that there are perhaps higher odds of postpartum hemorrhage in hospital as compared to home. I understand that this is a different infrastructure to developing countries, but it is a point of reflection. 
the image on the slide um, captures uh, a particular point of view that low-risk women may feel that they are put on a conveyor belt uh, to various interventions when they are in a hospital setting. The benefits of physiological birth are that, are that the uh, bonding between mother and uh, ch uh, mother and baby has been found to be greater, and this is possibly due to higher endogenous oxytocin levels, uh, which is a hormone implicated in positive behaviours such as love, trust, uh, compassion, generosity, and social cohesion. Physiological birth is a very important part of the early years agenda. Um, and is also very important in uh, the seeding of the uh, optimal microbiome. There are also now epi epigenetic studies showing that there are differences between babies born by caesarean section and uh, vaginal birth, uh, which shows that mode of delivery may have a very long effect, long-term effect on health, and this can uh, be seen in the concept of birth ecology. So if we look at oxytocin properties, we are largely familiar with its role in labor and breastfeeding, but it is also uh, one of the primary hormonal mediators of the emotion love, love between mother and baby, between husband and wife, between friends or siblings. It is also very important in sexual arousal and orgasm, and I've already uh, mention the fact that it is important in bonding but also in monogamy as seen in animal and human studies. In the classical oxytocin experiments of over a decade ago, rat females given oxytocin antagonists can have their maternal instincts obliterated. And in contrast, you can make virgin female sheep behave maternally towards foreign lambs if you put oxytocin into their central nervous system. Oxytocin is a pro-social hormone. It strengthens social memory. And in fact, if you look at someone eye to eye, it provokes oxytocin physiology and you are strengthening the connection. Oxytocin also reduces stress and reduces cortisol. And in behavioral studies in women, it has been found that women uh, can respond to stress by talking to other females. You can have circles of female that support each other and in um, doing so it increases their oxytocin and reduces their stress. It is thought that testosterone perhaps buffers this and that's why these behaviours are not seen so widely in men. Low oxytocin may also have a role to play in autism and there are ongoing trials looking at snorting oxytocin to improve social behaviours in autistic individuals oxytocin is also released with soothing touch in massage. Social neurobiologists have said that the quality of birth experience affects the capacity of a mother and child to bond and the quantity and quality of maternal care received during infancy determines adult social competence, ability to cope with stress, aggressiveness and even preference for addictive substances and this is thought to be mediated by oxytocin. Sociologists also say that the bonding between mother and child extends through society in neural bonding systems that are important for the development in individuals of loyalty to the social group and its culture. And that if this is compromised, then individuals have a compromised capacity for developing rewarding interpersonal relationships and a commitment to societal and cultural values later in life. And that um, it can lead to perhaps uh, stimulating other reward pathways, such as using drugs, sex, aggression, and intimidating others becomes relatively more attractive and these individuals can become less constrained by a concern about violating trusting relationships. If you look at the early years agenda and economics, Professor James Heckman's work at the University of Chicago, he is an economist, 
has made this area very prominent. He won a Nobel Prize for this work. Bonding is very important to the neurodevelopment of uh, the child. And the work of his group show longitudinal studies uh, to enrich the environment of uh, children when this has not occurred in order to improve cognitive, non-cognitive and schooling achievements as well as job performance and other social behaviours. This group came up with the one to seven ratio in that if you spend one dollar in the early years from naught to three, and this is actually from conception to three, you can save seven dollars in the public health budget of uh, those individuals when they become adults um, in um, antisocial behaviours and uh, the drug budget for those antisocial behaviours. The link uh, that is posted at the bottom of the slide is to a, a UK document stemming from um, a governmental um, document which is the Early Years Manifesto published in 2013 which recognises all of these things and the importance of getting the mother and baby bond right. This slide uh, looks at the microbiome and how important um, it is to uh, a newborn that uh, the newborn gut is colonised by vaginal uh, microflora stemming from the mother and vaginal birth. In this slide, it, this shows mother's oral mucosa and um, these are the bugs in the oral mucosa and here are the uh, mother's vaginal flora. Here is the skin flora of the mother and then when you look at if the baby is born vaginally it gets coated by mother's vaginal flora whereas if a baby is born by caesarean it gets coated by mother's skin flora and this is uh, what seeds the microbiome and the gut flora of babies. So caesarean birth does change the microbiome of babies. Optimal seeding of the infant gut flora happens from normal uh, vaginal birth. If this does not happen, then there is an impact on immunity. Vaginal flora, priming infant gut flora, um, initiates an intact immune system in the baby. If this doesn't happen, um, then a baby has a greater chance of developing autoimmune diseases, metabolic syndrome, type 1 diabetes, skin diseases, and even anxiety and depression because it is thought that gut flora influence gut neurochemistry and in turn central neurochemistry. So it is also important when looking at the use of peripartum antibiotics that we use these antibiotics judiciously. These two studies look at epigenetic changes when you compare normal vaginal birth babies with babies born by caesarean section. It shows that if you take cord blood and look at the white cells, that there are differences in DNA methylation which indicate a difference in the genetics. This will have some effect downstream later in life, but we're, we are uncertain of this at the present moment but mode of delivery uh, does have far-reaching effects. Technology and nature need to have a sort of balance. Um, in a chapter of a book called Birth Rights and Rights, the authors discuss, di discuss how the caesarean section fits into the law of diminishing returns. This is an economic law <coughs> described in Joseph Tainter's book the collapse of complex societies, where he looks at the rise and fall of various societies uh, during the history of mankind. It is seen that as societies develop, they develop technologies to improve themselves. However, if they overuse that technology, it can start to harm society and uh, in turn lead to the decline of that society. Uh, a modern day analogy is possibly use of pesticides in agriculture. These can improve the bounty of the crops and increase food supplies, but then if you kill off the bees and do not get 
adequate pollination, then food supplies can decline and this can harm society. Overuse of antibiotics may also fall into this model, as well as uh, overusing uh, caesarean sections as a technology. Technology has a benefit, but one should be mindful that there is a balance between uh, benefits and harms. There is also uh, 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 an important uh, reflection to be made on the balance of technology versus uh, just having time to care for patients, the kind of humane element of care. It was interesting to note a recent Cochrane review looking at the benefits of midwifery-led care and showing that it led to uh, better outcomes even in comparison to obstetric care. The MANGO study published in The Lancet, uh, again looking at caseload midwifery, shows that it is safe and less costly even for high-risk women. And this, again, um, makes us aware that having the time to care improves the physiology of women and improves biological performance. Care is very important because if you um, encourage all births to take place in institutions, uh, many countries have developed a factory line mentality towards birth. And when this happens, there can be, for the woman, a lack of dignity, privacy and respect for autonomy. Uh, this sort of care can occur in India. I'm told that it can be quite routine for women to have to have IV lines for normal saline or oxytocin and that they can be induced without medical reason, that they can find themselves lying on delivery tables for many hours and be forced to giving birth while flying on, uh, lying flat on their backs with no freedom of movement, with stirrups to hold up their legs. Episiotomy can be given as the norm without consent. Looking at the Indian situation from this social science publication, it says, while many governments have explicit targets to increase institutional deliveries, many do not have explicit targets or even a commitment to assess and improve the quality of institutional services for childbirth. In my lecture I showed the Amnesty International uh, short documentary on obstetric violence. It is a very powerful teaching tool to demonstrate that seemingly routine um, institutional care can be perceived as a violence by women. The link to this video is posted below and you can look at the video for yourself. In this lecture I also showed a clip from a documentary called Freedom for Birth, which is a human rights and childbirth uh, film. In the film there is, there is a discussion about uh, how economic drivers can limit the choices uh, regarding uh, the circumstances of birth for women that uh, technology can lead to a technocracy of birth and that fear of litigation can also influence the management of uh, labouring women. It also comments from, I suppose, a developed country setting that women have to be careful about the institution, that the institution they choose to give birth in because they may end up with the type of birth the institution wants rather than the type of birth that the woman would prefer. Again, I've posted the link to uh, the free online version of this documentary and you can look at this for yourselves. The reason that I've mentioned this documentary is that obstetri obstetricians become aware that uh, there are commentators on obstetric behaviours. So it could be seen that all that I've told you can be rather burdensome, an extra weight upon doctors, but I say instead we should see it as going hand in hand with the aspiration to continue to evolve to be the best professionals that we can be with the support of our professional body. So briefly to review the learning objectives for this lecture again, and that was 
to discuss the birthplace research findings with relation to maternal um, outcomes, uh, look at the benefits of physiological birth and the concept of birth ecology, examine that co continuity of care uh, and support actually improves uh, outcomes for women and also uh, discuss the fact that maternity care can become inhumane when institutions develop a factory line mentality. So what is the wake-up call? Well it is to the science, the medical education, the economics and the sociology of physiological birth. And also that it is an important opportunity for the amplification of oxytocin physiology in individuals and its effect on society. Also that there is an urgent need to humanising birth within institutions in many areas of the world. Thank you very much.